All right, welcome back to another video, guys. It's been like one month. Uh, I've been on like a break, I guess, and school and stuff like that, but I'm finally back. So let's talk about My Hero Academia Season 7. I'm not too much of a fan of the direction that they're going in, but uh, there have been some good episodes as well. So starting in like ep all the way from episode 3, there's this big twist that Ayama's mall that has been relaying information to all for one, like for all these years. Uh, if you remember like the the forest training incident or the initial like first season one at the UA training center where All Might fights the Nomu, that's been Aoyama this whole time. And I actually kind of had this spoiled for me, so it wasn't as much of a surprise when the episode came about. But um, I'm sure it would have been like an emotional moment in the show. And honestly, I forgot the 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 whole idea of having a mole in the first place like i th I forgot about that completely i don't know why but uh i guess it's because like they just never really addressed it after like a season four or something so that's why and uh it turns out that aoyama was quirkless from birth and he had wealthy parents and they didn't want him to be like different or you know to be too different or whatever so they went to offer one to get him a quirk but in return offer one forced them to like do to make them a mole for all for one and to relay information. So that's how he became a mole and stuff like that. And, you know, later on, Izuku shows up in the forest and sees Aoyama and hears of him talking to his parents, like, about All for One, or getting talked to by his parents about All for One. And then that's where he finds out that Aoyama is a mole. And later, Aoyama gets kind of, like, arrested and interrogated, and Izuku makes, like, a plea for his case, basically saying that, you know, you can still be a hero. And um, to be honest, I don't really care that much because I'm just trying to get to the big showdown, you know what I'm saying? So I'm not I'm not hammering, like, because I already had this spoiled for me, so it's not that much of a shock to me, so I don't require that much of an explanation, I guess, or, or to really let, you know, stay on the scene like that. And then they get the brilliant idea that the students all for one still thinks that Aoyama is working for him. They can use Aoyama to lure out all for one and the League of Villains to Class 1A's advantage. So, and then, you know, I think this was, like, a nice way of tying up loose ends. Um, but at the same time, the thought of having to wait one week for another episode with a long intro, a long outro, and riddled with, like, flashbacks throughout is just a little bit, like, frustrating. Or it gets me a little bit impatient, so I'm not... It takes me out of the episode, basically. And it makes episodes, like, one point less if I were to rate them, I guess. So moving on to episode four, the dope... Aizawa shows up and tells the police in Class 1A that he has a plan to use Aoyama to lure out um, the League of Villains and offer one. We don't hear the, the plan as an audience, I'm pretty sure. And then, meanwhile, Izuku and Ida go to the development course to repair their items, and then we see Mei Hatsume again. And I, didn't really, I don't really enjoy their use of balance, like their, the way that they balance comedic moments with like serious moments and dramatic moments. Because I feel like it just takes away from, it lowers the stakes, or it lowers what is at stake, and it takes away from, like, what we have just witnessed. For example, when they go to, the, you know, to repair their items, they're, like, it's animated in a very comedic way. And, you know, when they, like, do those freeze frames when, I don't know, the character's eyes are, like, enlarged, for example. And it's, to, it's like, done in a comedic way to get you to laugh. But we just found out that their friend of, like, how many years was a mole working for Offer One. So... In my opinion, that's not really the time to like animate it in a comedic way, or to have or to have these like funny moments, like these obviously meant to be comedic uh, moments in the show. I think they should tone it down a bit, and like keep it serious or keep it like focused on one, which is obviously serious, but at the same time not too much because I don't want like Midoriya crying like every ten seconds with like a puddle of tears and stuff like that. So just like a, a balance to it, <clears throat> and um, yeah. So now moving on to episode five. That one starts up with Dabi giving Himiko Toga like a vial of twice his blood from season six. And now that Himiko Toga can use the perk of whoever it is that she transforms into, this will, this will definitely be very important in the coming episodes. So um, I think I know how it's going to happen, but um, I, I am excited to see how it's implemented. And then meanwhile, Shigaraki is in a villain hideout and he's, his body is going through mutations. I think it has to do with the quirk singularity theory, which I still don't 100% understand. But basically, I think the, the quirks that he has are powerful and his body is, what's the word, acclimating or is adapting to it by making him stronger. 
and that is what the mutation is. Now for the fun part where things actually begin to pick up, uh, Offer One calls Aoyama to, or Aoyama's parents to lure out Midoriya, and he has a quirk that can tell when they're lying. So uh, Aoyama is like in some random place and then Midoriya comes. And this is all part of the plan for that Aizawa and All Might had to lure out Offer One to their advantage. And then Aoyama basically is like, reveals himself as a mole to Midoriya, and then Offer One appears above Aoyama's head. And then he tries to sneak in a shot by like turning around and using his like naval laser. But obviously that doesn't really work. But uh, I don't blame the guy. So it's worth a shot. You know what I'm saying? Uh, Offer One had his, his dart down. And basically that's what starts the whole, like Offer One realizes he's been duped. And then he brings, he summons his own henchmen through his rock gates. And then he sees the purple rock gate from Kurojiri appear in front of him. But that's actually being controlled by this class 1B student. And that's those portals summon the heroes as well. So Todoroki, Bakugo, Class 1A, and then all the pro heroes as well summon from that portal. So this is actually when things begin to like, the final fight really begins to happen. So I definitely enjoyed that episode because I just wanted something to pick up and actually happen. So towards the end, I like that, you know, I, I was also curious as to how like that purple gate happened or, or, you know, showed up. And at the time I was also wondering how um, you know, often one didn't detect lies in Aoyama's parents, so, and, you know, sometimes the show is clever with the explanation, so I already know in the next episode or two, we're gonna get, like, a good explanation for why or what happened, so that got me kind of hyped. So now in episode six, uh, basically we get, like, a flashback of all for, like, All Might and then Principal Nezu explaining to Class 1A, uh, of their plan. And basically what they did was they used Hitoshi Shinso's quirk, if you remember him. He's able, he has the ability to control someone if they respond to a question that he asks. So he controlled Aoyama's parents. And since they're genuinely doing what they're controlled to do, it doesn't come off as a lie to Offer One. So he controlled them to respond accordingly on the phone call with Offer One. And and on the other hand, Aizawa used like this class 1B student, Nato, I think is his name, to copy Kuroji's quirk. Uh, war gate and then because that will be like instrumental in the final battle as well so that's how they those two people were used in the final fight all right so basically the fight happens and starts you know it begins and they went through this elaborate plan like they had these mini fortresses made underground to sprout up and then swallow up like groups of the villains and then the plan is to push these like fortresses out of the portals that the nato creates to separate the villains like 10 kilometers plus apart because or even more because uh they can't have them cooperating in their efforts to stop the hero so to use it to their advantage and then a portal swallows up like all for one and then shigaraki and then dabby and all that and then they start to push these fortresses out of the portal and bakudo midoriya is supposed to push like the one with shigaraki out of a portal but Midor midoriya gets swept up by like Himiko Toga, she grabs him by the hand and then takes him to her portal, which honestly I just hated because I hate Himiko Toga and I just hate the character. She's like one of those like OP characters for no reason, like because it's not necessarily her quirk that's like OP. It's just like her clever use of like, I don't know, evading death. It's like Joker, for example, and I hate those type of characters because not from a writing standpoint, I think they're written well sometimes, but it's just like I just hate the characters and how they foil everyone's plan sometimes. But yeah. And so All Might, uh, no, not All Might. So All For One gets teleported to this like random place and then he's facing off against Endeavor and Hawks, which I think is like terrible pairing, but I love the duel because I think they're really good as a duel and we might see something about their backstory or their chemistry. But you know, Hawks' uh, weakness is obviously fire since he has wings that fly. And then Dabi gets paired up with Todoroki, of course. And then Shigaraki is supposed to face off against Bakugo, Best Genus, uh, the Bunny Rabbit, and then Midoriya. But now that Midoriya is not here, they have to kind of like make do with what they have. And Midoriya gets sent to like some random island by water uh, with Himiko Toga facing off against Gang Orca and Ochaka Uraraka, and then the Frog, the Rabbit, or no, the Frog, Sui. And basically, uh, the one that Shigaraki sent to, like I said, they made this elaborate plan, this smart plan, utilizing like Mei Hatsume and all the like smart like engineering people in 
My Hero Academia. And so they made this like mini turf or mini like world, a very small platform, sent it up to the sky. It's being levitated by like, these blasters and it's, it has like an electrical barrier that's powered by all the people with quirks that have to do with electricity. So I forgot his name. The guy with the electricity quirk in class 1A is part of the people powering up the electric barrier. And Chigaraki is inside of it. And the plan is, why they did that is because they can't have him on the ground on Earth detain like everything around him. So the plan is they have this portal, this little platform in the air. And underneath the grass, there are like platforms that will sprout up if he tries to decay it because it's not made of like just grass, not like uh, organic matter. And it sprouts up in the air and he's going to push Todoroki, Todoroki, what am I saying? It's going to push Shigaraki up in the air if he tries to decay it. And the platform is automatically repaired because Cementos is like in another platform right next to it, like repairing it along with like other engineering students and stuff like that. And from a distance, Aizawa's quirk is being copied by Nato. And then his eyes is also being like, constantly watered by that water guy so he's canceling Shigaraki's script as well so you can see how this would have been like very beneficial if Midoriya had been here, been there but I still think that they could have done something and then so they start to attack Shigaraki and stuff like that but then like I said earlier his mutations sort of activate and when he's being attacked by that bunny uh his hands start to mutate and then he just hits her and then it ends on that cliffhanger basically so I was I definitely enjoyed this episode the most, like up until like episode six. I think that was the best episode because again that was the start of the final kind of battle sort of. And again we see like the clever use, in my opinion, clever writing, in my opinion, and then just clever decisions made by different characters. And we see Aizawa with this plan and then All Might. And uh, it's very tense as well. So you're on edge of what's going to happen. And then comes the Midori getting sucked up by Himiko told us to some other place. So I wonder what's going to happen then. So yeah, I definitely enjoyed this episode. and uh, But the next episode is what kind of disappointed me a little bit. So now in episode 7, we kind of see where Midoriya ends up. He ends up in this island by water with Himiko Toga facing off against Uraraka and the fraud Sui and Gang Orca. And I just kind of hated this episode, I think from a writing standpoint, because I think some characters made some like kind of dumb decisions respectfully and i just hated the characters or, or just i just hated what they were kind of doing for here because i don't really understand it um well okay let's first start like it starts off with shigaraki explaining that you know his body's going to mutations and keep in mind aizawa like his work is all his squirts are being neutralized by nato's use of erasure so which means this is like a physical mutation of like physical uh, prowess so that's how he's posing a threat to all of them because you can't neutralize, you know, physical prowess. And then uh, Eraserhead Aizawa communicates with like Deku through like headsets or like earbuds or whatever. And he can't rescue Midoriya because the amount of time it would take to like go pick up Midoriya and then bring him back here would be too long if like Shigaraki's hands that are like forming could also use decay. So everyone would basically instantly die. So uh, Midoriya has to find his own way back somehow. So we got the explanation of how Midoriya never, like his danger sense couldn't pick up why Himeko Toyota was like about to grab him through the portal. But um, I'm kind of satisfied with the explanation. I just don't like Himeko Toyota. But basically the explanation is that like she basically kind of likes Midoriya. So it doesn't come off as danger when she's trying to hurt him which is weird because it's in her own sick and twisted way. So that kind of makes sense in my opinion. I'll take it. I just don't like the character again. So he gets swept up. And then this is what I was talking about, the comedic moments and balancing it out. We got like a freeze frame of him basically like acknowledging that. And then he kind of blushes a little bit. And it's like, because she basically said that she likes him. And then I'm just like, bro, like this is life and death. There's no time for all that. Like you don't got to be doing all that. This is not the flash. Like why is he getting so caught off guard because of that and i think he tries to get through to her to like kind of like reform her to become like a hero or kind of i think she try i think he tries to like you can still be a hero thing or you can change the way you feel or whatever you don't have to kill or whatever blah 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 blah. but like again that doesn't work and i don't know why he's making such an effort for someone that's like a, clearly a villain like this is not the case of aoyama being coerced into being a mole by all for one under the threat of death. This is Himito Toja of her own free will, like literally being a villain. Of course, again, 
sort of, sort of her backstory and stuff like that, but you get the gist. So I just hated the dynamic between him, her, and then Uraraka. And then later on, I guess she's like, okay, it's pretty clear you guys don't understand me. So she tries to, she begins fighting them back as well. And I also hated the fact that like Midori, this was even taken any time because Midoriya wasn't making any active like efforts to beat her, even though he's stronger than almost every character there. And I was like, this could have been ended in like seconds because Midoriya is faster, stronger. I don't think Himito poses any threat to Midoriya at all. And uh, I think the only people there that could have posed a threat was like two normals standing beside. And, and again, the clock is ticking. We got like 22, 22 minutes of this episode. And a bunch of it is being allocated to the outro, the intro, a bunch of flashbacks, and then freeze frames, and trying to talk through to the villain. So it was at this point that I was like, okay, we're not getting through like this fight, this little mini arc of like fighting. We're not getting through this until like the next three episodes, and then we're gonna go to like Todoroki versus like Dabi before we get to like Shigaraki again. So that kind of also took me out of the episode. But I do like later on Midoriya uses his ability to escape. Because now he tries, to, he has to find his way back to Shigaraki. So he kind of just basically zoomed out of there, which I finally loved because he's not just clueless or like just standing, hanging around. And now the fight is between Himiko against Uraraka and then the frog, and probably Gang Orca as well. And I just don't see how this is going to really end because uh, she still has that vial of twice as blood, so she might use that and then duplicate herself. But then I don't know how they're going to beat her or win. And I just hated the editing that was used throughout the episode. For example, we got like a freeze frame of Midoriya standing on the water. And it's basically kind of frozen, the frame. And there's like a voiceover basically saying, oh, Midoriya is very instrumental in this operation against All for One. And All for One is out for getting his quirk along with Shigaraki. And that's why Midoriya must be really protected. And it's like, we already know this. If you watched the show from season one to season six, you don't need this told to you again. And again, we already had all this information from the beginning of season seven. So it was made pretty clear to us that he is instrumental and it is his quirk that they're after. So it's like that rule, show don't tell. And they're just telling us this information that we already know constantly over freeze frame. So the time is just passing and it's making episodes longer than, than they could be. That's about where it ends though. Um, it basically ends with, it goes back to Todoroki versus Dabi, and then it ends when Todoroki asks Dabi why he didn't come home when he if like if he knew that he was still alive. So and then I guess we're just gonna go through his backstory more, which I am excited for. But that's about it. But uh, I do think like I hope I don't know why I'm surprised to be honest because this was probably the same type of editing used throughout all previous seasons, but uh, and I just never watched it weekly, so I guess I'm noticing it more a lot more. But I do hope that they can like really work on the pacing here and cut out like elim like eliminate unnecessary flashbacks or um retelling like saying the same thing twice so yeah that's about it i think i enjoyed it though but um yeah peace